Turn, turn to someone, say, I'm ready to hear a good word this morning. I didn't say Rich was a good preacher. Go ahead. I didn't say Rich was a good preacher. I just said I was going to hear a good word. There's a difference, right? You can hear a good word from a bad preacher. Anybody ever hear, ever hear a good word from a bad preacher? I mean, if Balaam's donkey can talk and bring God's word, I mean, I think I can maybe do that too, right? Yeah? Amen. As long as our dependency is upon him, not upon our abilities. I want to talk to you this morning about overcoming strongholds. Overcoming strongholds. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6 we're going to read. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. I'm going to, sometimes I read the scripture and then I take the words and I expand on the words. I'm just going to, we're just going to kind of, kind of go through the scriptures and some of the things that, some of the principles that I want to bring out in the verse. I'm just going to kind of stop in that verse and bring it out and do, do it a little bit differently than I normally do. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. That word flesh, we do not walk in the flesh. That word flesh is your natural is, is your natural nature. It's mortality. It's the physical world. It's that which is not alive by the Holy Spirit. So anything that's of the flesh, when the scripture talks about the flesh, it's talking about parts, either the whole person or parts within a person that have not come under the influence of the Holy Spirit in such a way that it's been redeemed. It's been brought to life. It's been uh, uh, transformed. You know, we, we have... When we, when we come to know Jesus as our Savior, the Bible says we receive a new nature. We become new creations in Christ. The old things pass away, behold, all things become new. The moment that we say yes to Jesus, the moment we come to the revelation through the Holy Spirit, that Jesus is the Son of God, and you come to the point to realize that, that you are in need of a Savior, and you answer his call upon you, the Bible says he called us. We've chosen him because, because he chose us first. So every one of you sitting here today, every one of you listening today on the program, uh, he has chosen you. Jesus came to the earth with a rescue mission to seek and to save that which was lost. And every single one of us were lost until we were found. So Jesus' mission to the earth was to seek us out. He had you in mind. Turn to somebody and say, Jesus had you in mind when he came to the earth. He was thinking about you. Go ahead. He was thinking about you when he was hanging on a cross. Yeah. Bible says that Jesus endured the cross with joy. There was joy before him in the, enduring the cross. What was that joy? It's crazy. He was anticipating. I mean, he went from sweating great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane to, to having joy. So somehow, even in that travail, that physical travail where his blood pressure was elevated, his heart rate was elevated, and the capillaries with, and the blood vessels that burst and sweat glands ran together and great drops of blood came from his head. That's the first place he shed his blood before he was beaten, before he was put on the cross, before anything. That's the first place his blood was shed for you. He was submitting himself to the Father. He says, Father, I'm, I've come to do this mission. This is the final part of my mission here on earth. But if you have another plan, you have another plan plan B, then I'm all for it. But he said, nonetheless, not my will, but your will be done. So it was Jesus' joy to do the Father's will because it was the Father that sent Jesus. Saints, one of the things we have to watch is that, you know, we're going to talk about strongholds here as we get through this, through this passage. I'm kind of ahead of myself, but I'm always ahead of myself anyhow. So I mean, you guys just have to like go forward and then go backward and go in the middle and just, if I do a rabbit trail, you have to like follow that and you know, follow the trail. Uh, I must say the the rabbit trails have greatly diminished as time has gone forward for some reason. Um, I think, at least that's my perception of myself. You guys could, you could if there's, <laughs> I won't even ask you. Keep your opinions to yourself. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to get back on this because that was a rabbit trail. For though we walk in the flesh, the natural man, mortal man, that those things that are not redeemed by the Holy Spirit. Saints, the moment we come to know Jesus as our Savior, our spirit person becomes instantly sanctified, set apart for God. Instantly, we are holy. Our spirit man, our spirit woman becomes holy. It's because Jesus has made it holy. There's nothing that you can do to make your spirit man holy. We are born in sin. We are born separated from God. 
We are flesh creatures. We are natural creatures. We are mere mortal men when we're born. We have a spiritual nature, but it's not alive with the power and presence of Jesus in our lives. So the moment we surrender to Jesus and accept him as our savior, our spirit person becomes holy. But then we have this other thing that gets in the way. It's called our soul. It's our soul, it's our mind, it's our will, it's our emotions. How many of you ever had your emotions get in the way and kind of foul things up? Anybody's emotions ever get in the way? Emotions are great. Can you, ima can you imagine living like little, uh, what's that called, uh, autotons where there's no emotion? No, we just speak all monotone. Hello, how are you today? I am fine, how are you? Things are nice, things are wonderful. And it's just emotionless. Hello, honey, I love you. You know, actually, there was inflection in my voice that I couldn't even be that. Hello, honey, I love you. You know, just, right? It would be miserable, right? I mean, so emotions are great, you know. But we, but we cannot allow our emotions to control us. And sometimes we get, our emotions get out of control. That's part of our, it's part of our soul person. So there's this ongoing process of our soul being transformed, being sanctified, being set apart for God. So there's an ongoing work, that's, it's a continuous work within us. The Bible says that line upon line and precept upon precept, here, there, here little and there little, we're being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. That's what goes on in our Christian walk. We're being transformed into his likeness. So there's areas of our, li of our, of our lives, of our soul, of our personality, <clears throat> that hasn't come into life and vitality and under the power of the Holy Spirit yet. It's, it's a process. Turn to someone and say, I'm under process. So how about a little patience here? Say, how about a little patience here? I'm under process. We are, we're all under process. If you think that you've arrived, if you think you've come to you know, spiritual maturity and you've arrived, then you're just self-deceived because we're all in process. I've been a Christian for 42 years and I'm still in process of getting my soul sanctified, set apart for the purposes of God. A day is coming that your physical body is gonna be sanctified. Uh, Right now, our physical bodies are diminishing as time goes on. Eventually, we're going we're gonna to die, but Jesus is going to come back one day, and he's going to catch up all the remains that are left behind in the air, and he's going to transform those into a glorified body. There'll be no longer pain, no more longer suffering. The former things have gone away. Behold, all things have become new. Mel, come in your way. <clears throat> that was impressive. Hey, just by the way, guys, you know, those... Those gifts you have have twofold. There's a very nice devotional. There's a beautiful handmade uh, uh, bookmarker. There's a little encouragement card in there. And there's some provision for you in there. There's some provisions. Now, that provision could, like, if, there's, if the sermon was, like, extended and went on for a long period of time, you guys, like, you're ready for endurance. I mean, you could just, you know, start eating some of that candy. If the sermon goes, like, past 1 o'clock or maybe 1.30, 2 o'clock, you guys could, like, start. What's that? You got your catch. This is good, yeah. So, uh, so this process of our physical body will be will be sanctified. So, so Jesus is after our whole being. He's after our spirit man. He's after our soul man. He's after our physical body as well. So we see this process going on. So now that we're stuck in this middle between being born again, knowing Jesus as our personal Savior, having fellowship with Him, having the Holy Spirit cause our spirit man and spirit woman to be alive and to become the adopted sons and daughters of God, to be the joint heirs of Jesus. We've, we're at that place, but we're in that intermediate place until our mortality puts on immortality, and the, inc the corruption puts on incorruption, and we come to that place where we receive our glorified body, when Jesus returns for the second coming, or when, yeah, when he comes to the second coming after that occurs that. So we're in that intermediate period. So, so there's strongholds in our lives. Some of us have strongholds in our lives that were a stronghold in our life before we came to know Jesus. Can anybody in here raise their hand and testify that you had a stronghold in your life that was broken after, at some point after coming to know Jesus as your Savior? All right, now put your hands down, thanks. Now how many of you can tell me that you already were born again, you knew Jesus as your personal Savior, you were, you were, you were engaged in a relationship with the Lord as a Christian, and you recognized there was a stronghold in your life and you pursued the Lord and you had that stronghold broken. Look at that, just almost as many hand, hands went up. So maybe more hands went up, actually. I think there was more hands went up for that than there was for people that had strongholds when they came into the kingdom. 
So we can see that these strongholds is something that's it's not, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's a, it's an, actually, it's a, an exciting thing if you look at it from a kingdom perspective. Because whatever your shortcomings are, whatever your inabilities are, whatever your weaknesses are, are whatever those things are, they're all opportunities for, for, the, for the, the Apostle Paul was heavily persecuted, 1 Corinthians 10, and he said he sought the Lord three times that this persecution might be delivered from him. It's called a thorn in the flesh. And the, and the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient in your weakness, my strength can be made perfect in your weakness. So when we have these weaknesses, we have these shortcomings in our lives, it's the perfect opportunity, it's the perfect opportunity for the Holy Spirit to become strong. Nothing more exciting than to, your, your, your faith is kind of affirmed. Every time God does something in me, not just for me, but in me, every time God does something in me, it's just a thrill to know that I'm valued by him, I'm loved by him, that he's still working on me. You know, there's an old song kids used to sing, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. He made the sun and the moon, the Jupiter and the stars. I forget how the song goes, but he's still working on me. Everybody know the song? Okay, a couple of you were shaking your heads. You could have sung along and helped me out, you know, but you're just shaking your heads, you know the song. Or you're just shaking your heads because he's still working on me. You know, getting into the groove or I'm not sure what's going on. I'll call Gary up here and start playing a guitar and we'll do a duet. One of these days we're going to do a duet, brother. I told him that. Okay. Though we walk in the flesh, the natural man, we do not war according to the natural man. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. This word carnal means of a physical, bodily, human ability or human strength. They're not of a physical origin. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical. They are not something that, is, that comes from the, from the soul. They don't come from the soul. We're not talking about willpower. We're not talking about grit and determination. But they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. This word stronghold is, is this pulling down of strongholds. Another way of saying it is for the destruction of fortresses. The pulling down of strongholds. The destruction of fortresses. So when you're pulling down of strongholds, these are, these are all things that are trying to exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. They are not physical fortresses. We're talking about spiritual, supernatural fortresses that have been built to keep us from reaching our fullest potential in the kingdom. There, these are fortresses that have been built to keep us from growing into spiritual maturity. These are fortresses that have been built to keep us from receiving the abundant life that Jesus promised. John 10, 9 says that Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said in verse 10, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. So it's an eternal life, but it's a supernatural, abundant life for us to live in this, in, on, this side of, on this side of eternity. There's fortresses that have prevented us. You'll see what these fortresses are in just a second. Verse 5, it tells us what we have to do. Casting down mad arguments. Destroying, I think, uh, I think the King James says casting down imaginations. New King James says casting down arguments. The uh, Amplified Bible says casting down sophisticated deceptions. I love that, sophisticated deceptions. Casting down arguments, casting down strongholds, casting down, destroying sophisticated deceptive lies and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Anything that tries to take the place of God, lies that attempt to displace the truth, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all the disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So we have this passage of scripture. It talks about spiritual warfare. This is personal spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, when it talks about the whole armor of God, put on the whole armor of God, you might be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy, the sword of the spirit, helmet of salvation, shield of faith, all these things. Those are for fighting for other people. Because at the end of the armor, it says, praying for all the saints. Praying for all the saints. So that armor is for us to fight for others. This is for us to fight for ourselves. This is a fight that you can only win, that you have to engage in. I mean, Jesus wins it. You don't win it. But I mean, others cannot engage in this with you. You have to engage in this. You have to bring every thought and every imagination that has fortified itself in your mind and created a stronghold in your mind. You have to bring it under the subjection of the truth of God's word. 
You have to cast it down. You have to destroy these fortifications and these things of thoughts. This is our individual responsibility as soldiers for Christ, fighting the good fight of faith, laying hold of the promises of God. This is, this is on you. Turn to somebody and say, this is on you. There are fortresses in our lives that cannot be demolished with human willpower, cannot be demolished with grit or determination because they are not of a natural nature. These are, they are spiritual. You have to com combat spirit with spirit. You have to combat the unholy spirit with the Holy Spirit. You have to have supernatural spiritual power and ability to overcome these strongholds and these fortresses. See, he's, he's saying, you do this. You cast down the imaginations. You cast down these, these thoughts that have exalted themselves above the knowledge of God. Okay, so these fortresses, these spiritual fortresses are edifices that are constructed of lies. These lies keep people from experiencing the love of God, freedom in God, joy of Jesus, and the peace uh, that is promised to each of us. These fortresses fall into three different categories. There's three categories where all lies can fit into. First category is lies that we believe about God the Father, lies we believe about God the Son, and lies we believe about God the Holy Spirit. How many of you can say, well, I'll just make this a broad question. How many of you can say that before you became a believer, there were lies that you believed about the, these three people in our Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And then afterwards, raise your hands, go ahead. And then, you know what, raise your right hand. Do that, raise your right hand. Now, how many of you, after becoming Christian, you've discovered lies that you believed about the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Raise your left hand. Just about everybody has both hands up. But every person has both hands up. So we come to, these lies were keeping us from God. You know, the biggest lie, I believe, that's perpetrated across the entire world has been in effect since right after man was created, was the, was the lie of that you're good enough and that, the, you, that you're good, that, I'm sorry, not that you're good enough, but a, it's a performance-based relationship with God. Performance-based relationship with God. Every world religion, you get to heaven because you did the right things, because you experienced the right exper spiritual experience or you kept the rules and regulations. You, you live by the code of conduct of your religion and as a result of that, you, are, you re re receive the reward of all of your good efforts while you're on the earth, and you, and you do that. The scripture says very plainly, salvation is not of works. It's not of works. Every world religion, every Christian cult has a works-based approach to being in right relationship with God and receiving the promise of eternal life. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. Christianity is the only religion that isn't based upon your goodness. It's based on his goodness, saints. It's based on his plan and his desire for you. So that's, we have those lies. We have the lies we, have about, we believe about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are, those are huge. Those things, our job is to seek these fortresses out and disassemble, disassemble them, destroy these for fortresses with the truth. Bring them into captivity. So they, when you bring it, you, I like to, like to use this illustration. If an, a wild animal got into your house, maybe you just, I mean, anybody, anybody lives in a country, you've had mice in your house. I don't care how well you keep your house clean, you got mice in there, you know. Every, every fall, I set some traps with some peanut butter in there, and I always pick up a mouse. They're looking for a, a nice warm place to hang out for the winter, and they like my place, but they're, un, they're an uninvited guest. So we, I, get, I capture those mice. They've come into my home against my will. They're trying to take over my house. I'm telling you what, some of you have experienced this. If you don't catch that mouse, he's going to get pregnant. She's going to get pregnant. Unless he has gender dysphoria, then I'm teasing. And, uh, <laughs> we'll go there. You don't, that mouse is going to have babies. They have, you know, mice can have 16 to 18 babies per litter. And, and it takes 21 day just the station period. And three days after delivery, they can conceive. That's 18 mice a month one mouse could produce. That's, that's not even her children that are going to be producing, producing mice. Six weeks after the mouse is born, it can have children. So you do the math. I mean, you could, your house could be lit. How many of you have seen the old movie Willard? 
Remember the rat movie, the movie about rats? I mean, it's old as heck. I mean, Willard, you know, that, there's the house was taken over, and you could hear all this noise, and there were hundreds of them inside the walls and in the basement. They were everywhere, you know. So if you don't, if you don't, if you leave it unchecked, you leave that mouse unchecked coming into your house, saints, you say, you know, you might see a couple of little, little deposits they leave behind, you know, little round black deposits, you know. Oh, I know what's up here, you know. Uh, I'll have to get some traps next time I'm out. And if the next time you're out, you forget. The time after that, you forget. And then for the next, pretty soon, you know, it's like all of your potato chips are all got holes in the bags and all of your uh, uh, cereal boxes or special care or whatever fruit loops that you eat have holes in there. And next thing you know, you know, you have a, you have a mess on your hands. So what do you got to do? You see one little dropping, what do you got to do? You got to go find them traps or don't go to bed until, uh, until that. I've had a couple times where I've seen the, the little droppings. I set the trap, and I'll hear it snap before the night's over. I love it, man. It says, yeah, get that. I'm going to capture that thing. Soon as it's, soon as I recognize it, I go into action. I set the trap, and that thing is out of here, man. But don't give up. You know, because why? Ah, it might have been a husband and wife coming in there and moving into the house for the winter. Might not have just been one. So I got to what? I got to reset that trap. Get ready to go. I caught four mice on one walnut. I use a walnut. I like the old, I'm old school. I like the wooden traps with the thing that snaps back. I gotta, gotta have a little bit of a challenge, man. It might snap, like snap your finger. Anybody ever snap your finger in a mouse trap? Yeah, yeah, so I like the challenge of that. Put that little rod over there. Okay, good. You know, you put it over here, and hopefully it doesn't snap when you set it on the ground. I put a walnut on there with a twist tie, and I smear peanut butter on there. So the peanut butter draws them there. They bite the walnut and it kills them. I've killed up to four mice on one walnut before that walnut you know, was, just, was eaten enough that it wouldn't work again. You know? And I put little notches on the trap. A little, you know, like, how many of you guys have shotguns? You just put notches on a, on a stock after you shot you know, rabbits or, or deer rifle. Anybody put little notches on the rifle, deer rifle? There we go. We got one guy who puts notches on his deer rifle. How many notches you got on there? One. Oh, good. Well, you have to think about it while I'm in church. I can't say. I have to tell you the truth. What's the truth? Oh, one deer. I know I tell my buddies at school four or five deer, but I know I only got one. No. I'm kidding, Jack. <laughs> How many? Oh, squirrels. Okay, squirrels. My dad's, my dad's old shotgun's all carved up on the side because he did that. I'm not sure what the pheasants or squirrels or grouse, what they were. But the point is, saying said, you've got to go into action. As soon as you recognize that there is an invasion, as soon as you recognize that there is an intrusive thing that has come into your home that you don't want to be there, that you know is destructive, and, it, and it's only out for itself. It's not out for you. Those mice don't bring anything for you, right? They come to take. Satan has come to ki take, kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to take away your joy. He wants to take away your peace. So the moment that you recognize that there is something in your mind, you've got to bring that under before it becomes a fortress. A fortress is only built because it's brick upon brick upon brick. It takes a while to build a fortress. So, you know, it's one lie gone unchecked. It's one untruth that we entertain, that we embrace. You know, and it's fortified. There's more bricks come on there because there's more people that are speaking that same kind of a lie. There's that same thing that's happening in that fortress. There's a stronghold. There's a stronghold of lies that is, that is built around the, the borders of the U.S. of A, guys. Think about it. There are strongholds of lies that you know, half the population or more believes. Think about it. Powerful strongholds. Our battle is not in the flesh. Our battle is not against politicians. Our battles are not against uh, party lines. Our battles are against the kingdom of darkness who's come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what it is. He wants to steal America. He wants to steal the faith of America. He wants to steal the power of the church. America has been more influential in winning souls worldwide than the, probably the entire, all of missionary in the last 100 years, I'll say the last 200 years of American missionary work, there's been more souls won into the kingdom through America's missionary work than all the rest of the world combined. All the rest of the countries combined. That's a, that's a factual thing. I mean, missionologists have these charts and all this kind of stuff. You can, you can actually find that information out. So... Juro, Juro and Marianne from Bulgaria, he says that they pray for America daily because the, the way that America goes is the way the rest of the world goes. 
if America crum crumbles, the rest of the world's going to crumble. He says, if America prospers, he says, we're going to prosper over here. And he says, we, we prosper in Christianity. The country used to be under, under communistic uh, rule until 1989 when Perestroika came and the wall was taken down. And, and Christianity, they were, he was part of the underground church. It was illegal to have church. He was part of that. And it was the efforts of the United States that brought light to that and, and helped, helped to, dis, helped to uh, break communism. Who was it that said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall? Who was that? President Reagan, yes. And it was a prophetic declaration, I'm telling you, because what happened? The wall came down. It sounded like, it sounded like, a, like a funny thing, like, yeah, right. Just because you said this wall's been up there since the end of war, since the end of World War II, 1945, I think they started building the wall, and they're going to tear it down just because you said it. Well, if God says it, and you say what God says, guess what happens? It, gets, it happens, right? That's what prophecy is, is to say what God is saying. That's what Jesus did. Jesus said, I only say what I hear my father saying. I only do what I see my father doing. What true prophecy is, is that you're saying what God is saying at that moment. So we have these lies that we have to tear down. The second part is we have lies we believe about ourselves. Every one of us have lies we believe are about ourselves. I can tell you categorically, without a doubt, in this room today, every one of us, every one of us has a lie about the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit it is still a part of our, uh, still a part of our worldview, and it still hinders us from uh, reaching our full potential in the kingdom. I can guarantee you, every single one of us in this room have lies we believe about ourselves. We have lies we believe about ourselves. Why? Because the lies have been said to us, and we've embraced those lies. We've received those lies. They became embedded in the marrow of our soul, and they have hindered us. They've they've hurt us. You know the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but nails never hurt me? That's, excuse my French, that's about an asinine kind of saying you could possibly imagine. I've been hurt multiple times physically, broken bones. And I have, they don't have any effect on me now. I, I, you know, I broke my leg in a motorcycle accident. I never think about climbing a ladder saying, oh no, a broken leg from back in 1976. I don't know if I should climb the ladder. I run up that ladder like I'm 20 years old on some days, not so, not so much anymore. Other days, it's, it used to go every other step. Now I do like, like this, one step, then the other foot. You know, it's like it takes them twice as long to get up and come down. But I'm still climbing that ladder. So, but there's been things that have been said to me, even before I broke my leg, that I still fight, that I still have to. It still tries to, those words still try to become a fortification in my mind. And I start seeing them bricks going up. I got to go over there and start kicking them bricks out before the mortar sets up. If you know anything about masonry work, they'll build a wall eight courses high one day. They'll come back the next day and find out something's messed up. They didn't do it right. They just grab those bricks and shake them, the blocks. They pull the blocks right all, all off, take your trowel, clean off the not quite set mortar yet, and rebuild the wall. Now the blocks are broken. You wait a week later and come back a week later, get the jackhammer out because that's the only way you're going to take that wall down is with a jackhammer. Every block is going to be broken. You can't, you're not going to be able to save one block. But if you get it, even though that wall is built, even though that masonry wall is built, and you get it before it sets up, before it becomes permanent. The Bible talks about besetting sins, sins that get into our, that we entertain in our lives. And most of the sins that we engage in are because of lies that we believe. The, the, the power that sin has over us is the lies that we believe. There's lies that we believe that if I do this thing, then the emptiness of my soul will be fulfilled. If I get a sex change operation, then I'll be happy because I don't think I'm the right person inside this body. And that's why I need to do this. Can you imagine? I, I, my heart breaks for these people. My heart breaks for these people. They're under such torment that they can't even recognize what biological person they are. They're under such mental, and emotional, and spiritual torment, believing a lie, believing multiple lies. And the society has been been quickly buttering bricks and helping you build that wall of lies around you, build that fortification in your mind. Saints, we need, to, we need to get a kingdom perspective about this. You know, broken people do broken things. Healthy people do healthy things. And broken people do things because of lies. You know, if, you know, I know that if I just find Mr. Right or Mrs. Right and get married, then all my problems will be solved. How many of you can say, man, that's a lie from hell? You get married, you got some, sometimes you get married, you got more problems. <laughs> 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 so 
Sometimes you've got more problems than you were. Some, how many of you how many of you have thought this? Hopefully you've never said this, but how many of you thought this? Oh, I was better off when I was single. You know? Oh man, that was too quick. You raised your hand. Well, George isn't here to defend himself. He's in glory, so that's not fair, Wendy. Yeah. So these are so these lies. So saints, the idea is that just like the mice, when these lies come. We need to get that thing captured and bring it into captivity, in a cage, into a trap, and eradicate it from our house before it can spread and multiply and bring all kinds of destruction and disease. Because disease comes from these rodents coming into the house, right? Rats and mice and, and uh, whatever, different things can come in these rodents and bring in, uh, you know, sicknesses and diseases that uh, causes us, cause us pro problems. So it's the same thing. When these lies begin to form in our, in our thoughts, we need to, as quickly as we can, get, those, get that wall kicked down before the mortar sets up. You know, I said it was a week. It takes about a week for concrete to c totally cure uh, on, in mortar. Not totally cure, but it actually takes a long time. But I mean, to the point where it can really bear weight. Like if you build a, a concrete column and you're going to put a steel beam on it, they say you should build it, wait a week, then put the steel column on it. Then it'll, it'll hold it. If you put it on too soon, it'll... It's going gonna, it's gonna to break the mortar joints that are there. So one of the things that's important is we attend church on a weekly basis. Because when you're hearing truth, when you're singing truth, when you're, when you're around other people that are full of truth, what's going to happen is some of them lies are going to be dispelled before they, before they can set up and build it. And that fortress is going to keep knocking those walls down. Satan keeps putting the blocks in front of us. We just keep kicking them down. Keep kicking them. You, do, you quit kicking them down, come back a week later, uh-oh. It's going to take a lot of effort now to break this down. It's going to take a jackhammer to take this down because it's got a stronghold on me now. Bob talks about you know, strongholds of, of thought that have us. The third area of lies that we believe, lies we believe about others. Lies we believe about others. About every human relational problem that we could possibly have, parent, child, brother, sister, siblings, husband, wife, friend, boss, coworker, friend, enemy, whatever, any of these kinds of things, Satan is actively involved in bringing discord. Divide, you know, you've heard the old saying, divided we, divided we, wait a minute, united we stand and divided we fall. You know? So Satan is actively involved in trying to bring discord within the church. There's over 200 denominations of the Christian faith in the United States alone. 200 denominations. And some of those things are divided in such, such minor things, it's hard to believe that they actually split and became two churches be, as a result of that minor situation. You know. So why? Because Satan comes in there to bring division. Because if he keeps us separated, and, uh, and unfortunately, it seems like Christians spend a lot of time arguing among themselves. You know, you could get into a big argument. I remember guys say, used to want to get in a big argument whether they believed in a pre-trib, post-trib, or mid-trib rapture. Well, what do you believe in pre pre-trib? You know, I didn't even want to go there. I'm not even having that conversation. Because it, because it, because whether you're pre, mid, or post, all of it requires conjecture. All of it requires suppositions to come up with that because it's unclear. Jesus has left it very clear. He left it very clear. He said, I'm going to come back in a day and an hour that you think not. Jesus even said this, I don't even know when I'm coming back. Only the Father knows when I'm going to come back. So if Jesus doesn't know when he's going to come back, how do you figure you're going to figure out how he's going to come back? You know? The Bible says he's going to come back in a day and an hour that we think not, like a thief in the night. You know, if you knew that there was going to be a thief coming into your house at night, you'd be up all night long with, with uh, Grandpa's muzzle loader across your lap, right? Or a baseball bat in your hand if you didn't have a, didn't have a, a, you know, a, a weapon of some kind butcher knife in your hand or something, all the lights on, right? Radio, radio blaring, making it sound like you're having a party. Keep the thief away. So we're all going to be surprised when he comes back. So Satan has brought division among us. He wants to bring division. He wants to bring division between households. He's being successful. Marriages in the United States are over 50% of marriages end in divorce. It's been a while since I've read any statistics, but of marriages that occurred uh, in the, the last five years, over 50% of those marriages ended up in divorce. No one, no one comes to marriage and says, I think I'm going to try this marriage thing. If it doesn't work, I always get divorced. When people stand at the altar and, give their, and, and say their vows before God, towards the end of it, it says, until death do me part, 
so help me God, or some end along those lines. So you're looking for a lifelong covenant. When you gave your life to your spouse, you were expected, to, this, you, were, you were in this thing for the long haul. We're supposed to do this for goodness, or wait a minute, for richer or for poorer, right? For sickness or in health, good times, bad times, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's supposed to be a lifelong, it's supposed to be a covenant, it's not, not breakable, only separation by death. So as soon as I don't feel like I'm in love anymore, I'm ready for a divorce. As soon as she hurt my feelings, as sure, sure as soon as he can't provide all my needs, I'm going to go look somewhere else to get my feelings massaged and my needs met. Those are lies that we believe, saints. Those are lies. And it's, pu and it's put across the boob tube continuously. Now, not, not, not as it's now we got it in our pocket. You can get as many lies as you can possibly imagine are right here. Worldwide lies are right here. Lies are here continuously. You've got to be very careful Googling. Google is not, you know, Google is not a reliable source because all it does is it takes you to other sources, right? You know, what do we do? First thing we want to know something, what do we do? We don't have to even type anymore. We just push a button and talk. I don't even know how my phone does it, but it'll start answering questions I never even asked because somehow the voice thing comes on and my phone starts talking in my pocket, you know. You know, I'll say something about whatever. I'll say ice cream. Oh, ice cream was invented in, you know, it's like, what? Pull out my phone and start talking about ice cream being invented in France or something. I don't even know where it was invented, but because it, it hurt ice cream. Somehow it gets, gets started. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat kicking and screaming with technology. This phone, I think, is seven years old. My phone is seven years old, so. I'm not going to update it until it dies, you know, and I don't trust it. So look what I did with my camera. Got my camera covered with a piece of tape. Because if it can talk to me without me asking it, maybe it can look at me without me asking it. I don't know. You ain't looking at me. I'm putting a tape over that hole. No, thank you. Lies about God, lies about ourselves, and lies about each other. Phil, come on up here a minute, brother. Come on up here. I'm going to ask, ask Phil to be ready to share his testimony this, this morning. And uh, just to see how God is for us, not against us. And I wanted to set that up better, but it's getting late and I'm talking too long. So go for it, brother. Go on up here. Wait, I need to get you a microphone. Yeah, uh, I still want it. It won't hear it on, on Facebook if you don't have a mic. Okay, thanks. Ken's going to bring you in. I just want to talk like this. Hi. Hi, I'm Phil. <laughs> I just uh, wanted, what's up, Gary? You the man. Uh, I just wanted to talk to you about something that really awesome that happened to me in the past, what now, six weeks. I was with my wife. She told me to go to Giant Eagle, cash a check. So I went down to Giant Eagle, and I cashed a paycheck. And uh, on my way back up, I just felt in my heart to just make a right turn and uh, so I come in I come in I made the turn like Batman right around the bend almost didn't make it <laughs> so uh, anyway I come here walk up through the doors and Pastor Rich is standing right there healing well yeah 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 for the healing rooms yeah and uh, so he's standing at the door and he goes what are you doing man <laughs> like you're you're cutting it a bit close and I was like, listen, I just, I had to. I had to pull in. So I come in, they sit down, and he asked me, what do I want prayed for? And uh, I used to, like, talk very vulgar. And I used to swear words all the time and talk people down. And I wanted to, you know, let's get rid of that. So I got it pulled on my heart, made the turn, come in, got prayed for, and, like, word. 180, I stopped swearing, not 100%, but the good thing is I catch myself doing it, and it's just so awesome, so I was like, you know what, that's cool, let's see what else he could do for me, and I wanted to quit smoking, me and my wife always talked about it, so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go next time, and I'm going to quit smoking. So the next healing room comes, and I come back in, and they're like, hey, what's going on? What do you want? 
I want to quit smoking. Throw my cigarettes on the table, and let's get this done. <clears throat> so we go in the other room, and they start praying for me. And that whole night, I didn't feel like I needed a cigarette. I went to work, had a really stressful day. I smoked five. Almost two packs. Yeah, so I smoked five on Monday. And then Tuesday, I had four. Wednesday, I took two puffs, made me feel sick, and I didn't smoke any. And now that was two weeks ago. I haven't had a craving or a want or a need for a cigarette. And now my wife quit smoking, so that's awesome. And I mean, it's like no matter what you think or how little or how big you need, God's there for you. And the healing rooms are the best thing that ever happened. I thank Pastor Rich and Diane and Nicole and Kathy and Mr. Floyd for just for being there. You guys are awesome, and I it, praise God. Absolutely. Worship team, you want to come up? Phil, how long did you smoke? Since you were 13 and you were 38, right? So you smoked for, what's that, quick, quick math? 25 years. Smoked for 25 years. Man, oh man, just think about how much money you're going to save. Aren't they like seven bucks a pack? $10 a pack. That's $20 a day you're going to save. $20 a month. Because why? Buy a big pack. Okay. Well, anyhow, it's a lot of money. You're going to save a lot of money. Excellent. Good. Good. So you're, I'll see an increase in the, in the giving because your tithe will go up because your spendable income has gone up. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. You know, God does miraculous things sometimes, saints. He does miraculous things. And, you know, we have this responsibility and individual responsibilities we have to break down these strongholds and, the, and these lies that are in our lives. But there's times where God just out of his love and out of his grace, he just moves in and delivers us. He's a, del he's a delivering God. Amen. You know, each one of us sit here today. I'm amazed that I'm a believer. I'm amazed I'm a believer. And we're only a believer because he came and sought us out. You know, so wherever you're at in your spiritual growth, be amazed, but don't be arrogant. Amen. Be amazed and don't be prideful. And don't ever do this. Look at someone else and expect them to be like you. Because if it wasn't for God's grace in your life, you wouldn't be where you're at. So it's all on, it's all on Jesus, guys. You know? Phil said the greatest thing that ever happened is healing rooms. No, the greatest thing that ever happened was Jesus. The greatest thing that is, and the healing rooms are even happening because of Jesus. If it wasn't for Jesus, nothing would happen. We would just be a bunch of people that have some human compassion, expel, expelling some human compassion, and you know, maybe might go away feeling better because you know some folks love you, but it'd only be from a human level. If it, wasn't for, if it isn't for the supernatural dimension of the Holy Spirit transforming us into his likeness, God is for us. He's not against us, saints. Turn to someone and say, God is for you. He's not against you. God has a marvelous plan for you. Yeah. Day to day, a little here, a little there, it's being unfolded, being transformed into his likeness, saints. It's the greatest journey. It's the journey of life. It's the greatest thing going on. 